So thank you for for joining this uh, this in conversation with Adrian Noble. Uh, it's a, an interview that I I did with Adrian after our our workshop, our online directing and act, acting workshop. The we first worked with Adrian back in two thousand and fourteen in a production of Hedda Gabler, and it had always been our intention to to ask him back to to to, to lead a workshop for for directors unfortunately because of the pandemic we're not able to to bring him over in person but we we decided to do a, an online workshop so over two weekends we we gathered in a in a space in Hong Kong, a rehearsal space with directors and actors, and we we decided with Adrian that we would look at two different styles of theatre, two different styles of directing and acting, and explore them over the the two weekends. So in the first weekend, we we focused on the the Greek tragedy, the play of Sophocles and his play Antigone. And then on the second weekend, we focused on Chekhov, the Chekhov final and, and great play, The Cherry Orchard. And we were looking at The Cherry Orchard through the, the lens of the, the Russian acting teacher, Stanislavski. And so we, we looked at the Stanislavski influence and his teaching methods as we did the rehearsal of the Cherry Orchard, along with a, a concept and acting called actioning, so there were there were there were two very different uh, experiences, or two two very different styles of acting uh, and directing for the, the participants to to get involved in an experience with Adrian, and of course it was great to be working with him because he did. Uh, yeah, Adrian Noble, as he he was the, he was the director of the Royal Shakespeare Company for a, a, a number of years, and had directed so many theatre productions. He directed, in fact, Antigone at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and directed the Cherry Orchard. So he was very familiar with the plays. But he'd also directed. He has also directed opera. And film. He's he's also been a film director and, and quite recently directed a, a a movie with Timothy Spall and Vanessa Redgrave, based on the the life of the, the English painter Lowry. So to have his uh, his wealth of experience was was really it was very interesting for us. Actors and directors to to be in the in the, rehe the rehearsal room with him. The thing also that was really interesting for me was to to feel, and it was something that I'd also I'd also felt during the rehearsals of the head of Gabler. Is really just the the rigor and the intensity and the passion that Adrian brings to the work. And so when you as an actor or a director are with him in the space, you, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like a football player who's suddenly put into the, the top football team with the top players or the top manager. You really have to raise your game. So everyone was really, uh, I can say, raised their game in that these two weekends. One of the participants said after the first, the first rehearsal, which the workshop rehearsal was two hours. He said to me after, I feel like I've been rehearsing for five hours. And that was the kind of rigor and intensity that, that Adrian brought to the, to the workshop. So it really was a great learning experience. And this hour conversation, that, well, it's not an hour, it's about 45 minutes that I have with Adrian now. He, he's going to talk quite a lot about, about acting and about directing and his experiences and also a little bit about what we did in the workshop and how, how that relates to acting and directing. And he gives a, he gives some really good tips for directors and he gives some really nice insights into, into the craft 
the craft of acting and that that is something that he was really he he was always emphasizing that what we do in the theater is a craft it's something that we need to hone and practice and so yeah i think for for you directors and actors that are watching i think you'll find some of his insights interesting he also he also talks about some of the experiences he's had of directing some of i guess our our greatest actors so he talks a little bit about directing yeah daniel day lewis and michael gambon and robert stevens in productions and that's i found that interesting too so i hope you enjoy it thanks for joining uh and i i wish you all a, a merry christmas and a, a happy new year when it comes so yeah, Adrian, I'd like to begin by by asking you. You know, it's when we when we started this to plan for this workshop, the idea was that we were going to be working with actors and directors, and I, I suggested that the directors would observe the actors working. And you said, no, 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 let's let's have the directors in the in the room with us, working on the floor with the actors. And I guess that first question is why? Why did you why did you want to do that? Well, it was the way I trained many years ago at the Drama Centre in London. The, um, the bulk of our course as directors was doing exactly what the actors did. So we would start the day with movement for an hour, which might be love and it might be classical ballet. And then we would do acting classes. We would do other things that were just for the directors and the actors would do things which were just for the actors. Yeah, but I found that enormously enriching because you underwent the process of acting alongside the actors. We weren't very good at it. It kind of didn't really matter that we weren't very good at it. <laughs> we we respected the process and we understood the process. In particular, we understood the process of identification, the processes of that, that Stanislavski under. Um, outlined in his um in his works at the end of the, the, at the end of the 19th the beginning of the 20th 20th yes. century so um and, and and it seems to me that that in our workshops um that that was a good principle to pursue uh, and i think probably um you i think you learn a lot more by doing it rather than <laughs> just by watching it and, and also, Sean, there's a little thing whereby perhaps it's because in certainly in, in the West, a lot of directors traditionally enter the field of directing via university. Mm, so, they, yeah. so, they, so they come with, with, with their brains first. When, yes. uh, when actually an actor won't come with their brains first, they'll actually come with their instinct first. Yes. The, they're, they're frequently highly intelligent. That's not what I'm saying. But actually mm. their instincts will lead them into... Uh, the and, and so I it's I always found it very good to get um to get directors on their feet to mm. sort of yes. learn, learn on the job yeah and the idea of yeah the I mean that's something that you mentioned a lot this idea of the instinct and you had us doing work and very much at the beginning before we went into the the text work you were really working with us on the floor through movement and also you know that you know there was some we, there was some exercises that you were doing with us moving. With chairs, saying text with the with the with the thought, and it seemed to induce real instinctiveness in the in the actor, rather than what you said, this kind of thinking. Where what, what yeah. should I mood? I should I be in now, or what should I be feeling now? So then that was something that was very interesting in that in that work. Well, I, um, I, I instinct is a very hard thing to to. Um... To define actually mm. and but I, I a i think you can work on your instinct um mm. through your experiences in life and as a director and through what influences you expose yourself to whether it's yes. movies or dance or books or art galleries or attending you know diff different lectures whatever there, there are ways of enriching enriching yourself but you see when you're when you're on the floor directing on many occasions, you will have to rely on your instinct. Um, hmm. 
you can you can plan a lot of things as a director in advance but very often that leads to rather dull theatre actually it leads to sort of you know, well, they'll all move over there and you'll find very often within a couple of minutes of um, your rehearsal, you'll find that all of your, not all, but a lot of your ideas don't really work at all. Actually. <laughs> and that what the actors are doing is are actually more interesting. So yeah. you know, well, that's more interesting. He hasn't walked straight on stage. He's walked around the the stage. So well, maybe I so instinctively you have to know which way to 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 direct the, mm. the rehearsals uh, and you've got to and you've got to rely on that literally dozens of times a day so you mm. should sharpen your instinct and you should and you should trust trust your instincts um, rather than just what i call um running for home mm. you know, i know mm. i know what my goal is i know exactly what my show is going to look like and i'm just going to do everything to achieve that goal you know which is yes, yes. Day, but it, can, it can be a bit deadly no, yeah, that, that's interesting. So there has to be a real open there. And, you know, we often talk about the actor has to be open and, and ready, but the director in the rehearsal room has to be as well. Absolutely you know? right. Absolutely um, right. And I think there's something, and I do, I do want to go back to the, the, the formative years of the young Adrian Noble uh, going to the drama centre, nervously sitting outside waiting for the, the audition, or was it the interview? And I think in the in the book you, you you say that I think was it some of the young actors who were already there they'd say something like to you whatever they ask you don't say it's about self don't say you're here to, that's, that's, that's don't, right. don't say you're here to express yourself say it's about transformation and like that's and, and, that's and I love that because I think it, and it's you know and you you know with the career that you've had but you. You, you mentioned it in the book and you've mentioned it in the workshop that it was probably one of the crucial, most meaningful pieces of, of advice you've had for your career. Can you say just a little bit more about that idea? You know, this that it's not in fact about self-expression because I also want to bring in, there was a really interesting question from one of the directors about this, about self-expression and about, uh, well, let's, Talk a little bit first about you know this self-expression, yeah. and then well, I'll move on to the I'll move on to the other it, question. It, com it comes down to the the the, um, the the processes of acting. Okay, yeah. so we explored in our workshop um, a little bit about about the gr Greek theatre with Antigone and the idea yeah. of putting a mask on, and the mask transforms you in one way or another. Um, and that I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. Excuse me, and and then we talked about the way that Stanislavski talked about identification with a character. Now, let's imagine this: each character, sorry, each human being has a center, mm. which is not which is it is a physical center, yes, but it's also a moral center, an, an, an intellectual center, an emotional center. Um, and sometimes one meets people who are you, one could say, oh, they're off center. They're they're they're, they're not comfortable with themselves. You know, they're they're <laughs> now each character also has a center, and mm. the job of work isn't, I think, for an actor isn't to say, well, well, actually, um, Madame Ranyevskaya is exactly like me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, possibly, but it's much more interesting, I think, to say what parts of me are like Madame Ranyevskaya. So I move towards her centre. Yeah. So what you have to do as an actor, very often as a director with actors, is to move the, is to shift, is sometimes even to knock the actor off centre. Mm. So they, they will instinctively move. So doing exercises that, that are not intellectual will help knock an actor off center there are other ones like like i i will sometimes use animals yeah so i will ask my actors to impersonate an animal let quite literally become physically become that animal and move yeah. like the animal have have the instincts of of that beast and then yeah. from that move straight into trying out the scene mm. Mm. and that animal will if you like knock them off center Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, we. I'm, I 
we've talked a little bit about before, you know, and my training with Lacoste, that was very, that was very much part of one part of his training was this whole, you look at the animals and then you move into that, you know, you transpose it into the character. Yeah. And then, and then, and the sun, and I, I mean, just going back to the drama center, it was interesting because when you, you know, when you talked about your time back there, it seemed to be there was, there was these two influences. There was the American, can we call it method Stanislavski, but you also had the French tradition, which was very different. And I think in some ways you were very lucky that at a formative age, you were able to be able to have both these, in some ways, very different styles. Well, additionally, additionally, Sean, there was a third leg to this particular stool, which was the work of Rudolf Laban, who was mm. a choreographer and a dancer. Now, now Laban developed the notion of the psychology of movement so yeah. that he developed a, th a theory and a practice whereby one could, one could identify what movements would be appropriate, would emanate from a particular psychological type, mm. um, which I, again, I found fascinated in, in a way it kind of integrated the two the french yeah. and the russian it, integ it, it integrated them but 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 you see which was marvelous for me all three of those geniuses none of those geniuses were english do you see so in a way <laughs> I, I was trained in a, in a european you're, yeah, you're a european yeah you were rather than rather than an english tradition that's, that's really interesting you know, I want to now. I want to now. I want to because you've talked now. You've talked there about acting and the, the, you know the idea of self-expression through acting. There was a very interesting question from Valerie, and I want I want to talk a bit about that more because I know there'll be some young directors watching this. And you know, her question was, well, you know, there's been so many productions of Antigone. How can I? How can I do my Antigone differently? Or hike and you had a kind of interesting answer for her on that. And just to talk a little bit, you know, the idea that a lot of young directors want to make their, can we say they want to make their mark and they want to have their their take on whether it's Antigone or it's on, on Shakespeare. I mean, you know, that Bonnie and I about 15 years ago, we, we did a cultural exchange in, in Berlin. We spent some time in Berlin. We went to see a lot of German theater. We saw some great productions, but we saw so many productions over there that were like conceptual productions yeah, of, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so can you, can you just say something, I, I guess it's to share, your, what's your opinion or your feeling about this thing that, you know, we want to, to have the concept first, because I think you said something, you were sharing something differently. But if I remember right, it's it's the rigor, it's the play that serve the play, and then yeah. you'll find. Yeah. Look, so this is very difficult because I think it's a, a it, it's always been difficult for young directors to, to 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 make to make a start. It's never not been difficult, but perhaps it's even more difficult now because mm. because um um because of social media, because of, you know, you can see all sorts of other productions or images yes. online, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, so that's like, right. It is quite, quite, it's quite difficult now. I mean, and I totally understand why um, a young director will, in a way, look to create a different production of Antigone or The Winter's Tale or whatever to, to make their mark. And I can point, I won't actually, but I can point to directors who have done very, very flashy productions. And the critics will all say, oh, he's flashy, she is very interesting. Look, mm. they've set Romeo and Juliet in it, and it's all got pop rock music going all the way through. How interesting. You think, well, okay. Um, <laughs> but they've done what they wanted to do, which is to make yeah. them. So, people yeah. watch. so I can't be, I can't be, um, snobby about this at all mm. because I think it's really, really tough. However, yeah. all I can say is I can say what I believe. And I believe that our principal job is to serve the play. That's yeah. our first, first yeah. priority. Now, inside our workers in service to the play, there's a, there's a whole world of opportunities to find uh, different resonances to to um, create create different worlds to lead audiences into different worlds. 
because I find that and that would be my advice because I, I find that very often a, a, a tight concept mm. can sometimes, often I'm afraid, be quite reductive mm. and that in a way the actors will go through that in the first week and then they'll be looking for by which i don't mean i don't mean a design idea you know like like mm. um here, here's a design idea 12th night let's set 12th night on an ocean liner brilliant there you are it works fine <laughs> i've never done it i've never seen it it must have been done but i've never seen it i've never done it so actually viola arrives at the beginning rescued from the ocean and then the person up there and then there's the captain and the it works you know i'm yeah. not talking about that that's not what i'm talking about which is mm. that there you are it's that's for free someone can do it it's it's out there <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> sure. it's, it's, it's a freebie okay what i'm talking about is is something when when you say that um um the characters are all different expressions of 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 um folly right so all of the characters are gonna have silly silly hats and silly and silly makeups because they're all you think mm, because it's all about folly you see oh okay oh yeah it's yeah. it a bit tedious to say. yeah 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 so be but and here's the big but i would just say be rigorous be rigorous yeah. because you're not stupid as a director your actors aren't stupid and respect your yeah. audience they're not stupid yeah. so you've got to you've got to make a world on stage in which the actions and 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 words and 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 spirit of the play are yeah. logical yeah yeah i mean that, that that really struck out the idea that rigor and that it is a craft you really and any craftsman really has to go into something rigorously and deeply and when you go in rigorously you'll find you'll find many ways to find that expression yeah. but through I mean, through the I work th i think it's a useful distinction you just made there actually sean that 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 that, that maybe what we can do is to teach craft mm. and to and to encourage our next generation of directors to embrace the notion of craft what perhaps you can't teach is inspiration is, mm. is 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 are those you know you can't maybe you can't teach artistry yeah 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 i agree i want i want to you know i, I want to just go because the, the the second you know we, we we looked at antigone and we looked at the the greeks of the first weekend and i want to i want to move on now to the you know to stanislavski and, and to check off and I, again there was you give out you give a, a historical background which we all we all really found very useful i just want to go a little bit into that before we talk about the specifics of the work that, that you mentioned you know you mentioned how you know one thing at the at the beginning of the 20th century you know this this teacher actor stanislavski came along and in a way he was very lucky that chekhov this anton chekhov was around at the same time and also how how you you talked about being a very we were living in a modern time rather than the time of before if you go back to you know the greeks and you brought in you know you brought in people like freud and you brought in darwin can you i'd like you to share a little bit more about that because i think it's really useful for us as actors and directors when we're doing you know when we're looking at Chekhov or looking at Stanislavski to get that kind of historical perspective of mm. where we were can you talk a little bit about that Yes, I think that very often what we regard as as golden ages of theatre or explosions of of the theatrical arts, um, with with benefit of hindsight, then they're, they're not quite as accidental as we think. Mm. Um, so if you look at um, if you look at Elizabethan theatre and the Jacobean theatre. Um, look at the, his, the historical context there. You could say it's the, the there's been a couple of generations of Protestantism, which is the religion of the individual, not the collective. You mm. could look at the idea that 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 Elizabethan sailors were beginning to create a huge empire around the world, um, that a lot of a lot of money was pouring in, and look at the fact that um, that there was effectively 
sponsorship of the arts um, yes. Lord Chamberlain's men he called the Lord Chamberlain's men because he gave them money I mean uh, <laughs> yeah. the king's men he gave them money um, and so the sponsorship of the arts added to which London had become this extraordinary kind of um, melting pot of energies different people from different nations were coming there people from, from around the different parts of, of England were coming there and you'll find that if you look at, and I think the same thing started to happen in the UK in the 50s and the 60s. Mm, is, yeah. You've got, you got the, the, the success of the Second World War. You've got money coming from the Arts Council. You've got the beginnings of immigration. All of those things were happening. So, mm. But if you look back at the time of Chekhov and Stanislavski, again, there, the world was shifting. And, yeah. and if you read Gorky, or Tolstoy, or Ch certainly Jacob, you know the world is shifting. Um, mm. That noise at the end of the cherry autumn, what is it? It's the noise of the, it's, it's, it's the noise of the, of, of, of the future. Uh, future. And it's gonna, things are gonna fall. Yeah. Are gonna fall. So, so that sort of research, it, it may sound like book research, but actually it, it, it helps the actors because it gives them a sense of that this, this, you know, I, when I directed the Cherry Orchard, I, I said to the actors, actually, the leading part is played by the, ha by the house. Mm -hmm. the house they live in. That's, yeah. that's the leading part. You're all supporting. Yeah. But <laughs> you come into it and you live it. And at the end, it will be left empty. And this one old man is left there on his own who dies there. Yeah. Fierce, yeah. Just, just yes. dies there. So, so one could, you know, maybe, maybe with the benefit of hindsight, we know that the 1905 revolution in Russia was about to happen and the 1917 revolution was about to happen and the 1914 war was, was about to happen. But they knew something was going on. So yeah. your actors, when you're doing that play, any of those plays, when you do the Three Sisters or, what, or, or whatever, that sense of a world shifting, and very often the shifting world will lead to extraordinary artistic um yes. events yeah yeah and and it's interesting as well that you you know because we were you we were talking also about acting styles and you know you mentioned the watching the when you were doing an early production at the rsc watching the a production of the moscow theater and being amazed that they are not so subtle yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> You know, way of performing, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and, it, and that, that was interesting because you know I think the other thing that was crucial at that time, and you you, you mentioned that as well. We can talk a little bit about this because you know it, we do go into this thing of you know acting. Only in this century are we talking about the acting for the screen and acting for the stage, and and how different that is. And you know, and you know, the screen, the the emergence of cinema. At the beginning of the 20th century and the individual and how that really did affect our our you know acting and how people look at acting but i'd like to i'd like to ask you you know one of the me we can't go out fully into the stanislavski method and even just the basics of it here but one thing that you were one thing that you asked us all and it's, it's very crucial in the work is you know what what do you want you know you would ask the character what does what does this character want in this scene? What does this character want? And you know, it was very interesting for me reading your. You give a really a, a really nice example of how that answer can actually form the the basis of your interpretation of the play. And you know, you give the example of King Lear. You know, you did you you did two productions of King Lear with two titans of the of of the stage. You know, Michael Gamba and Robert Stevens and and it was complete, you know, the interpretation was completely different. Can you talk a little bit about that example and, and its relation to the method, to Stanislavski and these, the, the idea of objective and wants? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, certainly. It's very interesting because, because the play King Lear, um, it starts out with a crisis and every production of King Lear has the same crisis. The crisis is the king, uh, effectively abdicates and says i'm going to divide my my into three so we know what the action is that's not a secret 
Um, mm. And in fact, Gloucester at the beginning and can talk about it beforehand, so the audience know in advance what, mm. what, what, what might happen. So it's vital that the the director and the actor find some sort of common ground about what his is objective, and then more importantly, what his super objective. Super objective. Is. Do you yeah. see? So he's a. I, yeah. I think they both say. Well, his objective is to divide the kingdom in three so that they would probably say, oh, so that it's, it's well, he says, to, to avoid strife after my death. But you mm. think, he doesn't know anything about politics. It's kind of, <laughs> that's the quickest way to create, to create strife. So actually, you have to look to what's it, what's, what, are they, what do they want? And you say, well, I, they, do they want peace? Mm. Do they want power? Yeah. Do they want forgiveness? Mm. I mean, all, all, all of these possibilities. And and Bob and I, and then my, and earlier than that, Mike and I went went in. We, we, we made quite 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 different choices, partly on based on 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 their pers per personality. Mike's was more more political, mm. um, and our production became more political, and and actually in many ways bleaker. Mm. Um, and you know, with, with, Mike, with Michael Gambon, yeah, the, the first, yeah, one. yeah, Michael Gambon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much, much and, and it ended with with on on a on, on quite a almost a Beckettian note mm. of yeah. nihilism. You know, yes. there was there was virtually nothing. No, nothing. I remember, yeah, I remember. And crucially the, and very yeah. interestingly, that at the end of King Lear, there are no women. Mm. Now, therefore. Therefore, there can be no children. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, Bob Stevens, he had a, he was a much more emotional character, and he yeah. wanted to be loved, and he wanted <laughs> and he, he yeah. wanted to love love everybody and hate everybody, and you know he yeah. was irascible and and yeah. and lovable, and and the audience loved him in a way in a different in a very different way to mm -hmm. the way they love Michael Gambon. Um, they probably loved him more than they loved Michael Gambon, actually. Yeah. Um, and so it felt rather heartbreaking breaking at the end when he Sorry. carried his little girl on stage. Um, mm -hmm. Well, he couldn't carry her because he wasn't strong enough, but we carried, the soldiers carried, carried Cordelia on point. So quite different things which, which come down to their, their sort of super, super objectives. Yeah, it's, really. it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, and like, it, it can, yeah, the two actors and then the interpretation and and that is something as a director you 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 have to you have to forge that that close relationship with the actor and yes. with yeah yes i mean with, with robert stevens i didn't i hadn't worked out in advance well i i had a hunch what it would be like because of how 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 warm he is as a human being and how warm he was on stage but yeah. i wanted to do king lear with him partly for him because he was dying yeah, and yeah. I did I did full stuff with him, and I and I, I, you know, he was one of the very first actors I ever saw in my life when I was a young teenager, actually. Yeah, and I loved his full stuff, and I wanted to do King Lear for him with him. I, I seem to I remember. I think I, when we did that talk back in fourteen, I asked you what was what is some of the greatest performances you, you ever saw, and I think you you reminisced about. You said it was a rehearsal that he'd arrived yes. late. <laughs> yes, that is absolutely correct. That's right. He, he did you were, arrive you late. Were, knowing that you're you're a real stickler for yeah, yeah. Tell that story. I think share it. It's a great story. Well, well, I was directing Henry the Fourth parts one and two for Stratford, and and it was our final run through in the rehearsal room in London, and um, I said, you know, we'll we'll start it at ten thirty. We'll arrive at ten. We'll do a warm up. We'll go on the dot of ten thirty. And Robert wasn't there at 10. He doesn't like doing warm-ups anyway. So I thought, mm, fair enough. All right. <laughs> and then it got to quarter past, 20 past, 25 past. And then it literally got to almost the stroke of 10.30. And the door were opened. And he walked, he kind of effectively walked straight on, straight on stage. <laughs> he didn't talk to me. He didn't talk to anybody else. And he gave a, a performance of spectacular um, emotional and intellectual range with minute um, uh, technical 
technical skills. I mean, quite, yeah. quite extraordinary. And yeah. we were very, very, very lucky to have been in that room. He didn't always do it like that, by the way, because he had a view. He said, you can do it, only do King Lear twice a week. So you might uh, do it five times a week, four yeah. times a week, but the audience won't get it because you can't, yeah. it's not possible to do it that many times. Yeah. In a way, the singers, it's like that with singers, actually. They, they don't even schedule them um, <laughs> five times a week. They only schedule them maybe two, two they always have, always have at least one, if not two days off between a performance. Yeah. And you know, going back to your other leader, Michael Gambit, you know, you also, because we were talking about, you know, I think it was very early on, in fact, in the workshop, you talked about craft and you talked about, uh, and we were talking about Stanislavski and you actually said, you said something along the lines of, well, Mike would never, he would never think of, you know, he would never talk about it. And it, it, reminded, me, it, remind, it reminded me of the, I was watching an interview with Coppola when he was talking about Brando directing him in The Godfather and he said something like, you know, Brando would never talk about, he'd hate talking about acting, you know, but he said he would give him, he would give him some salami or he would give him a prop and he would give him a cat <laughs> and then that would be the way for him to go in. So it's kind of interesting, you know, this yeah. idea that, yeah, we, and, but, but I'm sure that the craft that Brando learned from Stella Adler was all in there. It was all, in, <laughs> so the rigor. Absolutely the right. And, and the craft that Michael Gambon learnt when he was a, virtually a spear carrier for, for Laurence Olivier back at oh, the National yeah. in Chichester. Yeah. He would have learned that. He would have learned that. And it's, it's very interesting, you see, because what he would say, sometimes there'd be a, a conversation like in the green room, in the cafe, with young actors who were do, doing understudies. It's very interesting. And Michael yeah. would say, no, no, well, I can't do a Michael Gambon accent here. He said, no, 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 no. Your job, isn't, your job isn't to sort of make up how you would do it. The audience aren't interested in that. Yeah. They, they, you should do it as closely as possible to the actor you are you are understudying. And then he said, why? Because if you do that, you will work out why, you'll have to work out why they make those choices and how they do it. And he Wonderful. said, that's what you need to know as a young actor is how do you do it? And, and, and that's, he said, I understudied like Laurence Olivier. He said, no, uh, all I had to do was do it exactly <laughs> like Larry did it. And then I'd work out how he did it. The great Which teacher. That's amazing. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, okay, we're here with Lawrence Olivier. Let's can we let's stay with him, yeah? Because yeah. I think it's because I think in some ways, uh, you know, you know, people often talk about how, you know, to learn acting. Some of the go and watch, go and observe, see the greats, and of course they had they had that opportunity, and he had it, you know, really so close because he was an understudy. The reason I'm free associating here, yeah, but just because you bring up Olivia, did you did you meet him by the way? Did you did you? I met him once. Yes, <laughs> I didn't. I never worked together. I, I met him once in this sort of rather absurd situation whereby it was the opening of the bar, uh, the, the the Barbican Centre. And 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 we were there because we were we were we had we the Royal Shakespeare Company was a part of it, and um, I took the actor Anthony Sher Tony Sher as my guest, yeah. right? And um, Tony, the, 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 her, the Her Majesty the Queen started going past, right? And we wanted to create a bit of space, so we stepped back a bit, and Tony stepped back and trod on somebody's <laughs> foot, right? And then and we heard this roar from behind us, and we turned round, and there was Lord Olivier, Sir Lawrence <laughs> Olivier, standing behind us, having just had his toes crunched by Tony Sher. <laughs> Went on to play Richard the Third and all the other guys. So I, I met him. Yes. And I very quickly said, I'm, so, "I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> my, my, my name is." <laughs> he said, "No, no, 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 no." Dude, that he's tall. That was my only encounter. Well, you know, for me, and I'm, I am free associated here, but, you know, we did, we did the, you know, we did Chekhov and we did, you know, Sophocles. And for me, you know, what you were talking there about for the young actors and the young directors nowadays, they can see so many things. You can go on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly for my generation, definitely for your generation, you know, you, you you weren't able to watch things, you know, so I wasn't able to watch Laurence Olivier, but what, what I like to do is I like to, you know, I, I have Harold Kluerman or I have Frank Rich or I have, you know, I have these collections of theatre critics, Kenneth Tynan, and you read about them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I was, just, I was just doing some little research because we were going to be doing, you know, we were doing Chekhov and we were doing, 
and this and this is this is a this is a funny because Chichester, 1963, Lawrence Lawrence Olivier is playing an Uncle Vanya with Michael Regbray playing Astroff, the doctor. And I think it's Clearman, he met, he talks about this, uh, you know, the, the alcoholic doctor who is traumatized by this uh, this patient, this railway man that he's lost in his, his and, and he said that Olivier, you know, most actors that he's seen before had played it in a way with a kind of sadness and morose and, and Olivier, he laughed. And he had, he kind of, and it was this kind of alcoholic laugh. And he said the humanity in that laugh of this man. And and the, the other thing I'd like to mention, because it's a, a, it's another Olivier story, is the, the Sophocles when he was doing Oedipus. And they said that moment when he, when he pulled out the eyes and there was a cry, that deep cry of pain. And, and I think it was Ken Tynan and asked him, you know, where did that come from? And someone had told them this story about seals in Canada and how they how they how they caught the seals is they would put the meat down with the salt and then the tongue of the seal would be stuck to the ice. Oh. Yeah and I know and they would they, they would oh. they would emit this horrific cry and Olivia had heard the story. And that was so it was kind of interesting. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of into a lot of Olivia's side because you know whenever we talk about the whenever we talk about the and you mentioned it all you you know you said it very crudely we have the inside out and the outside in and everyone always brings up the story of Dustin Hoffman coming in and the marathon man not slept a wink because his character would be like that and Olivia says why don't you act you know and of course there's a bit. <laughs> it's a bit, but you know, I mean, what, what's your feeling? You know, the, Olivier, you know, there, there, there's imagination, or, and then you have yeah. the other type of actor. You have your Hoffman, or you have Daniel Day Lewis, and you have. Where are you with that, Adrian? Would you, yeah, in, in this conversation? Well, you have to. Uh, my, my my position on that is 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 fluid. Um, I, you see, somebody like Olivier. You can argue he is. Why don't you act? You, you can argue that he can summon the sort of intensity of of um, of experience that Dustin might have from staying up all night. He he can just summon it. I mean, we shouldn't forget this that actually Olivier Olivier didn't always sit happily in movies. Mm. Um, Sometimes people thought he was a bit over the top or a bit a bit theatrical, actually. Yeah. Um, and that in some ways, somebody a talent like Ralph Richardson sat better in the movies, or, or Cary Grant, or any of those pe people who are kind of almost played themselves, actually, than rather mm. than rather than sort of great. But but my my my, my feeling is you 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 have to respect the way a diff different actors come out. Yeah. Um, and if you've got Danny Danny Day Lewis on the set, you haven't really got any choice. Actually, you've got mm. with with a, with a, a talent that big, you've got to um, you've got to go along with it. I will tell you a little a little a little story related about Danny about this going back to our original thing. That yeah, because you worked with him in Britain. You were at Bristol. I, I worked with him. him. He was in our was in one of our companies at 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 at, at, um, at the Bristol Old Vic, and. Then he joined the RSC and played Romeo. And he would say himself that he wasn't the most successful Romeo in the world. And he was, he is, he was, is the most, one of the most beautiful people you'll ever see. But at Bristol Old Vic, I was doing the, the recruiting officer and he was, he was, he was literally players cast. He just left drama school. And I cast him as, um, What's he called? B Bullock, I think his name is. Who's who's just who works with cows? Is a is a mm. peasant, mm. and Danny was brilliant. Yeah, because and I think he was brilliant because he could leave behind yeah, all of that stuff of the, the image, that image. Lewis's yeah. son, and the, you know the yeah. great poet yeah. and the and, and the very 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 good looking young man, and he yeah. played. He played something, and, and it was a complete act of transformation. Yes, I'm going to. That's the word. I mean, what, 
Where we and, 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 and he was yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Was it Romeo, it was kind of there's a lot of overlap there between Danny. Yeah, and yeah, Romeo. yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. So that idea of transformation, yes, and the, it, yeah. it released something in him. Do you see? I do, I do. And you think, and, and I guess also for, I mean, you've worked with actor, you know, the the greatest actors of our time, and they've they've some that have been able to go from the stage then to the screen, and I guess it's, it is more challenging for you know, to, to be able to, to be able to do King Lear and to, you know, to do it for two, 300 performances and to, you know, to, to, to go the way, if, if it really is into that Stanislavski, to go deeply into it, to summon that emotion that it can be terribly challenging, but for a, for a screen actor, it can be done. I think it was, I think it was Pacino that said that the, what's the difference between the stage and the screen, that when you're, when you're on the stage, you're on a tightrope, and when you fall, you really fall. But when you're doing it for the screen, you can just, you can get up and walk on the tightrope again. So there is that. Uh, well, that in ad ad additionally, you have to, um, in the theatre, to one degree or another, you have to project, by which I don't mean speak louder. I mean, you have to, you have to slightly magnify yeah. the, 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 the character so, so that it, com it, it fully communicates. It's, it's interesting, you see, that one of the great, developments in the theater in, in in the last 40 years has been uh, the little black box so that up until really the mid 70s you performed in la in one performed in relatively large spaces with the audience at one end of the room and the actor at the other end of the room yeah uh, the proscenium art in between that's what most theaters were like and then really pioneered partly by the fringe theatres, but also partly by the RSC with the opening of the other place in mm. the mid seventies. Not only were the actors and the audience in the same room, but it was a very small room, which yeah. meant there was no need whatsoever to speak loudly. You yes. could just sit and think and the audience would come into you. So there was a, 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 a complete overlap between film acting. Yes. The intimacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adrian, I want to end with the, I want to, it's going back to the actor because it was something that you said, and it, and again, you said, you, you mentioned it twice and it kind of struck me. It was going, it was going to that, an idea that the actor, the actor means something in this, in this society. And let's see, because you know, in the modern time, we, it's, it's very often about celebrity. It's about, you know, the actor has become famous and, you know, and the Daniel Day Lewis, whatever, you know, it, it's fame and we, we, we see them from that kind of, like kind of gods that are up in the, up on that pedestal up there. But, you know, you talked about the actor as being a healer, the actor as being a leader, as being different to bankers, that they have a role in this society. And it, I mean, for me, and my, my old my, my old mentor, Lecoq, you know, he was someone that was very, he often talked, you know, the theatrical forms that he loved and that he studied, you know, the Commedia dell'arte, the, the melodrama, the, the Greek tragedy, the clown. They were all forms of theatre that were for the people. And they were yeah. there to, they, you know, and I, I think that's something that, you know, it's really precious. And it, and it was great to hear you talk. Talk a little bit more about that, your feelings on that. Well, well, I mean, I do feel that quite profoundly. And, and I also feel that the, the problem with it is, of course, that um, with the arrival of, 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 of kind of mass media and soap, soap operas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, the, the, you t the, there tends to be this sort of belief um, that, well, and anybody could anybody could do it. I yeah. remember I was doing an opera once in, in 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 France in Lyon, and the guy who ran it came back, was running the intendant, came back one day, and he said, he said, God, I've just I just been in a school, and I asked them, what do to all these kids, right? What do you want to do? And he hmm. and he said, four fifths of them said they wanted to be a TV presenter, huh. not an actor. Not a, yeah. not a scientist, a, a TV presenter, because they said, well, all you have to do is just read out the news and then they give you a lot of, <laughs> they give you a lot of yes. money. 
<laughs> oh, he was, he was very upset. You know, he didn't want to be. A, he thought, "Oh, I want to be a singer. I would like to be. A, I would like. I would like to be an entrepreneur." No, 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 no. I want to be a TV yeah. presenter. And people look at people look at soap operas on television. They think, "Well, well, I could do that." Mm. You don't have to be an actor to do yeah. that. And to a degree, that's true. And you mm. certainly don't want, don't have to be an actor to to do blogs or what you know. Yeah. And so. There's been a sort of a, 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 a kind of a watering down of the craft. Um, yeah. But I think there's a, I don't know, I felt it very strongly in America mm. when I was working in Canada and San Diego. And I, and, 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 and I, and I feel it, I feel it here as well, a, a, a sense that, that young actors want to, they want to, involve themselves in not just exciting work but challenging work why because challenging work is not just more difficult to do which it is but challenging work will take the actors and the audiences into worlds lands yeah. and approach frontiers that other mm. things do simply do not do mm. uh, and and you know love island does not does not <laughs> know what but love island does not take you to the same places that yes. King Lear will take you. Yes. And, and, and the Greeks did know a thing or two about this, you see, because they also understood l what we might call low comedy. They understood clowning, because look it at is. Aristotle, it's, it's brilliant, they invented it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but they also understood the need for a society to look itself in the face yeah. and to ask those big questions about, Am I, is my first loyalty to the state or is my first loyalty to my family? Yeah. Which is it? You've got yeah. to choose. Yes. And, and, and people they, have to oh, yeah. nowadays. And, and I think it's very, very, you know, I think it's very important, which is why they saw theatre as being, almost, going to the theatre almost as a civic duty. You know, oh, go to the yeah. theatre and learn how to cast your vote. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so it should be. I mean, you know, we it can it can be spectacle, it can be spectacle, it can be entertaining, but it can also it has that central quality yeah. of it that it really is. It, it's asking questions that are very yeah. for us yeah, in this yeah, time, yeah. this culture. Yeah, the actor and the director and the director. <laughs> Adrian, thank you so much for your. For making the time for this 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 talk, I really really appreciate it, and we'll. I really hope that we can see you, not not online the next time, but really in person. We we we'd love to have you back and and work here in, in Hong Kong again. So yeah, I wish you I all the best. Very much. I love that very much, and and I, I, all my times in in Hong Kong have been very very happy, and um and thank you so much for setting all this up because it's been. As I did say in the workshop, it's been very interesting because not only um, have I enjoyed doing it, but I've learnt, you see, mm, yeah. very interesting because I've learnt, I'll tell you what exactly, I was trying to think when I was just walking to a, turn, turn my computer on, what I principally learnt <coughs> is the way one can use the, um, the techniques of the early rehearsal to set up a, a whole vocabulary for the final production, which is really, yeah. really, 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 really interesting. I think it might therefore need a little bit longer in order to rehearse it, but it, it, it gave me confidence again. I thought, well, I know how I might start doing the cherry orchard, having done that, or I know how I might start doing um, the, 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 the Antigone. So that's been marvellous for me. So thank wonderful, you. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm really I'm so delighted to hear that, really. And how can the workshop experience, it can be so... Yeah. So beneficial. Very rich. Very rich. You take okay. care, Adrian. All the very best. Eh? We'll, we'll talk to you. Have a lovely Christmas. You and too. A, and a happy new year.